Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to the Rain Garden uh, workshop, the seminar that we're doing online. Um, I'm just going to give it one or two more minutes here to let folks settle in if anybody else is coming. Um, and we'll get started promptly after that. All right, everybody. So I hope my audio is working all right and that everybody can hear me. Um, there should be a function, um, if any of you can find it, to raise your hand. So if anybody um, is able to find that function and let me know that they can hear me okay, that would be, that would be great. But uh, good, people are raising their hands, so that's awesome. All right, so we'll get started. And this is uh, Rain Gardens and the Rain Garden Rebate Program, a design and installation workshop for homeowners that we typically give um, through a series of four workshops uh, in partnership with Lakehead University, but we've had to adapt things, of course, uh, this time around. So this is our first webinar, and I also want to thank folks who, unfortunately, I had to cancel um, last Tuesday's webinar on um, just due to some unforeseen circumstances. So for those of you who could join us tonight, thank you very much. And uh, this webinar is also going to be recorded, so I can send this out to anyone else who might be interested as well, uh, most likely sometime next week. Um, so this is part of our rain garden education programming and the rain garden rebate program. Both programs have been running since 2015 with funding through the city of Thunder Bay. Um, and my name is Julia and I've been coordinating uh, both of these programs um, for a few years now. And um, it's all sort of been part of the city's efforts for residential stormwater management and landscaping to improve lot level drainage and to beautify property and to learn how rain gardens work and some of their benefits in our city and beyond. So I'll just go through uh, the next slide here, if I can get it to go. Um, so the agenda here, um, can everybody see the screen as well? I'm assuming that's um, visible, the agenda here. Perfect. So the first section we'll go through is understanding stormwater and the water cycle in both a natural and an urban context. Um, and then we'll go into rain gardens and why they matter and why they're important in this context. Um, we'll also talk about the City of Thunder Bay Rain Garden Rebate Program. Um, so that's a program that is open, uh, again, funded by the City of Thunder Bay and, and just for City of Thunder Bay res residents um, because of that. Um, but this workshop, this webinar is open to anyone in our region who is interested in um, establishing a rain garden on the residential property, whether or not you want to pursue the rebate or not, but there will certainly be a section on the rebate program as well. Um, and then we'll have a question period. So any questions up to that point, um, there should be a function on here where you can type in your question and then I can answer it live. Um, and then after that, we'll go into the nitty gritty about rain garden design and installation. And then we'll have a couple of exercises where you at home can go through the worksheet that you've got um, as part of your rain garden resource package um, to look into some rain garden sizing calculations. Um, and then we'll go through a gallery of before and after pictures of rain gardens in Thunder Bay so you can get a sense of what homeowners have done in the past. 
And then if there's any final questions, we can go through those as well. Um, so I'm hoping that will be wrapped up ideally in, you know, a couple of hours. Um, I haven't really done the online format before, so it sort of remains to be seen when we'll wrap up and it depends on questions as well. But surely if you uh, don't get a chance to ask a question this evening, um, you can reach me by email at julia at ecosuperior.org. Um, and if you do choose to pursue the rain garden rebate application, there is a, there is a component where I'll, we'll come and do an in-person site visit to talk about your project before you start. And so that's a great um, consultation period, basically, just to answer your questions before you, before you begin. So there's a couple of resources. Um, what you should have in possession, either a digital copy, but more likely a, a physical format is our rain garden resource package that includes our newly updated rain garden installation manual. So this is a publication that we put together a couple of years ago that's specific to our region. So it has a planting guide with a bunch of suggestions for um, mostly native plants found in this broader region that grow really well in planting zones two to four. So that broadly covers our area. Um, and then there's a lot of pictorial examples and design guidelines that will help homeowners in their installation process for rain gardens uh, right here in our region. There's also near the beginning of that uh, manual, a glossary of terms, just to familiarize yourself with a little bit of terminology in terms of planting and rain garden design and installation. Um, so that's that. And then before we get started, if you don't have it already, it might be a good idea just at some point um, in the first half of this workshop, if not right now, just to grab a pencil and eraser. Uh, a calculator, just a simple calculator would be helpful as well, um, because we are going to go through uh, some rain garden sizing calculations on your worksheet afterwards. So that'll be handy for that time. So what I want to do is start off with, you know, why this is important. And it really goes back to understanding how water behaves over a landscape. Um, in a natural setting, the water cycle typically we have in this diagram here, uh, a lot of pervious surfaces, elements in the landscape that allow water to be soaked up. So typically, especially around Thunder Bay in our region, we have a lot of forested area, some grasslands, a lot of farmlands, heavily vegetated spaces where water can fall down as precipitation, rainfall or snow. Um, and then it slowly gets absorbed into the ground. And so in this typical water cycle, we can see how it moves in a more natural setting. So we have evaporation from our local water bodies, Lake Superior, that'll eventually condense into clouds. And then again, that falls as you know, rain this time of year. And then there's a lot of what we call infiltration. So a lot of opportunity for that water to soak into the ground, very, very close to where it falls, if not exactly where the rain does fall. Um, and from there, the water will, say, travel down the leaves of trees in the forest canopy. It'll trickle down the branches, the trunks, and it'll slowly make its way into the soil. And then from there, it gets absorbed and will replenish groundwater. Anything that's contaminated within that rainwater will be broken down, generally speaking, by microbes in the soil. So there's that kind of decontamination or filtration process. Um, and then a lot of uh, groundwater is replenished in this way. So all those spaces between the large rocks and the bedrock. And then eventually that water is migrated through the groundwater and then replenishes our streams and our water bodies nearby. Um, there is a, a some degree of runoff from, you know, overland flow, whether it's from slopes, hillsides, mountains, that kind of thing. Um, but by and large, you know, the, the message here is that a lot of water has an opportunity to soak into the ground very close to where it falls because of that green space. And then the cycle just repeats itself. So the path of water behaves a lot differently in an urban context. So in an urban water cycle, this is a typical example of what might happen. So you'll have evaporation coming up, condensation, the rain comes and falls down, but then it falls over what we call impervious surfaces. So a lot of hardscapes, 
pavement, parking lots, rooftop buildings, you know, driveways, sidewalks, roads, etc. Um, and there's a lot less opportunity for this water to fall and be soaked into the ground near where it falls. Um, so there's a lot of infiltration that's inhibited. Um, and so you'll get a very much an increase in surface runoff that will run off surfaces and, you know, get discharged into nearby streams and waterways via storm drains. And there's a lot less opportunity for groundwater to be recharged and for that water to be filtrated um, or filtered through the ground and then for streams to be replenished that way. So the movement of water behaves a lot differently as well. Um, you know, in a natural water setting, movement of water was very slow. You know, it trickles down the forest canopy, it finds its way into the ground, it slowly moves through the soil and into groundwater. But when you're looking at the urban water cycle, if you were to um, look outside in a heavy rainstorm, all of that water has nowhere to go. And so there's a lot of surface flow and then really quick discharge into nearby waterways. Um, and so oftentimes you get this sort of feast and famine behavior with water when, you know, if there's a lot of dry periods, not a lot of rain, some of these streams can dry up in the middle of summer. But then of course, when there's a heavy storm, you, you do get increased flooding. Okay, so the speed um, and the volume and water quality are both impacted by these differences in, in the two cycles. And that also um, ties in with our municipal collection systems. So generally speaking, there's usually three main components to a collection system in a municipality like Thunder Bay, for instance. First off, there's the sanitary sewer main. And the way I like to frame this is it's a lot of your internal drainage features within development, um, like a household. So when you take a shower, do your dishes, run your laundry, flush the toilet, um, all of that water gets discharged into the sanitary sewer main um, for treatment at the wastewater treatment plant, which is again treated and then discharged into Lake Superior. Generally speaking, separate to that is the storm sewer main. Um, so that's kind of all of the capturing infrastructure outside. Um, so when it rains, you have water falling down your downspout, down your sidewalk, um, parking lots, impervious surfaces like streets, all of that water is catch, um, captured in catch basins, which usually goes, it bypasses treatment for the most part, and then is discharged into storm drains, um, which eventually lead to nearby waterways like the rivers and creeks flowing through Thunder Bay. Um, in some cases, and, and in Thunder Bay's case as well, there's a, there's a small percentage of what we call a combined sewer system. And that's where both of these mains are together. And so all of that water flowing from your external sources like rainwater and internal get sent to the same collection system, which is then put into the water treatment plant. Um, that's when you sort of have issues like sewage backups and those sorts of things when there's just too much water coming in and overburdening the system. Um, a lot of older infrastructure, I believe in places like New York City, they have a lot of combined sewer systems. And the move really is to get those to be separated so that you have um, fewer variables impacting the, the collection system. But there are impacts even when they are separate. And we'll talk about those um, in a minute here. So in an urban context, the impacts of urban runoff um, and in Thunder Bay, have sort of like two components. There's the water quality element and then the water quantity. So we have street drains in Thunder Bay, like most cities, um, and they're actually connected to rivers and creeks within the city. So example would be McVicker Creek, McIntyre River, uh, Niebing, those, those sorts of areas. Okay, and they lead directly into um, the waterways, like I just mentioned, and then they discharge into Lake Superior. Um, so none of this water is treated, essentially, before it winds up in these areas. And so um, that can include vehicle fluids and heavy metals, um, for instance, that abrade from your tires or your vehicle, um, engine oil, motor oil, um, that can all get combined in with storm water. And so in a big rain that will be sent into a storm drain and then be discharged into local waterways. So there is a contamination issue there. Um, also with things like cigarette butts and litter, um, some folks might believe that cigarette butts are comprised of paper, but they're actually made up largely of plastic. And so all of that plastic 
doesn't biodegrade. It stays in, in the natural environment. And so every time, you know, you see a cigarette butt flicked onto the ground, more than likely speaking in the next, you know, big rain that will be flushed down the street and down into a storm sewer. Um, and then into the nearest waterway, basically, which, which will eventually find its way into Lake Superior. Um, there's also other contaminants in the environment due to our human impact, for instance, asphalt sealers, tars, that kind of thing as well. Um, they'll abrade in the sun, break down in the sun, um, and also be washed away in the rain. And also things like pet waste. Um, if dog feces aren't picked up and they're left on a boulevard or in a park, um, in a heavy rainstorm, that could get flushed away and combined in with surface runoff for stormwater. Um, same goes with chemical fertilizers as well um, that we might put on our lawns. And so that's more speaking to you again, the water quality impacts in an urban setting. Um, and then there's also the water quantities that, that we'll experience as well, especially when there's a heavy rainfall in a short period of time. Um, so this picture I took a few years ago um, when we had a lot of persistent rain in November and I went to the McVicker Creek uh, Bridge at Court Street and took a picture, this one right here, um, and that was after several days of persistent rain. And I don't know, maybe some of you are familiar with this, with this area here, but next door is the McVicker Manor with the bed and breakfast. And there was so much water coming down the creek, all of this water getting discharged either by overland flow or through storm drain discharges, that there was water flowing over the gazebo in the yard, um, over the grass, and then eventually finding its way across the river banks and back into uh, the creek, which had swollen to, you know, three times, if not four times its size. So there was a heavy, heavy amount of water flowing down in a short period of time. And so at that point, you get issues with erosion of the river banks. Kaministiqua River is also a very big example. The LRCA has been doing some erosion studies on, on that river in particular in the last few years. Um, and then you also get impacts to wildlife and fish as well. The turbidity, so the cloudiness of the river is increased. And so navigation can become difficult as well. So knowing all of this with a little bit of kind of background information on how water can behave in an urban context, we can look at measures that homeowners can take, even large property owners, but we're speaking specifically to residential um, homeowners in, in this context. But there are measures that we can take to reduce that burden on the municipal system, bring those volumes down, um, hold water more on site and closer to where it's falling and to manage that storm water for all of the benefits that we were talking about in terms of water quality and water quantity. Um, so that's where rain gardens come in, which is under the larger umbrella of what we would call green stormwater infrastructure. And we'll get into a little bit of different um, types, both on, both on a municipal or larger engineered level briefly, but mostly in this residential context. So what are rain gardens? Um, this illustration comes out of um, our, our manual, which was written um, in partnership with um, a group of people, including a landscape ecologist, Rusty Schmidt, and a team of illustrators as well um, that put together one book in Minnesota. Um, and so you can see, you know, it, it's good to just take a look at this drawing, this illustration, and really note some of the features of the rain garden that make it a rain garden. Um, rather than a pond or just a regular perennial garden. So you'll notice here that it's shallow and it's a landscape garden bed that you'll see is connected to nearby downspouts. There's one up here with this house and the arrow that's basically, you know, indicating that there's water being channeled into the rain garden. So it's capturing water from a hard surface and in our context it could be the rooftop of a shed, a garage or a home. Um, and it's designed to capture that water and allow it to soak into the ground within a, fa a fairly short period of time. We're talking about a 24 hour period. Um, so it's not a pond. Uh, typically rain gardens are planted with perennial wildflowers, grasses and other native species, um, some of which can handle you know, up to a day of, of inundation, you know, so they don't mind being moist or you know, going, drying out from time to time. 
Um, so it's not a pond, but it is a sort of catchment tool, a landscaping feature that allows you to capture that water that would otherwise, you know, be sent into storm drains or run off into an otherwise unwanted area of your yard. So again, um, they're often planted with wildflowers, but that can also include grasses, shrubs, you know, some trees as well. Um, so we're talking about perennials here. Um, rain gardens are not typically, you know, associated with annuals. It's not a vegetable garden. Some people have found creative ways to integrate vegetables and food into their rain gardens and that's a great thing. Um, you just want to make sure that the source water, the water coming into the rain garden is not too contaminated. You know, if it's coming off of a, a parking lot, for instance, that might not be a good thing. But typically, generally speaking, in a, in a, a residential context, we're talking about perennial species, uh, plants that come back year after year, basically. And they only get bigger, their roots, they set deeper roots over time, and they only increase the function of um, the rain garden over time. Um, they also filter water into the ground. Again, instead of, you know, that water going into storm drains or into another unwanted area of your property. Um, so that's the ultimate goal of the rain garden. This is actually a photo of one on Hill Street um, in their front yard as well that was installed a few years ago. And we get these nice lawn signs as well for anybody participating in the rain garden rebate program. Um, they can put an educational lawn sign just in their, in their front yard. And so this is another example of a residential rain garden. And I wanted to put it in just to show you some of the contrasts and the differences. Um, they might look a little bit different. For example, this one is a much more softer feel. It blends in with the landscape a little bit more than the last one. This one back here, you know, there's very distinct defined edging. There's a manicured lawn around it. Um, there's a lot of stone and other features like driftwood. Um, and so there's, you know, some differences in the feel and in the style, but essentially it's accomplishing the same goal. The principles are there where you have a landscape depression. You have some mechanism to capture that water via, you know, a channel or a swale um, from, a, from a hard surface or some other source of, of um, runoff. And essentially it's just gonna settle into there and um, disappear within a day. And um, that's essentially the basic function of a rain garden. So that's in contrast to um, something a little bit more engineered. And this is what we would call municipal low impact development. And these are pictures from a larger, uh, what I would call engineered rain garden or an LID site um, on the north end of town in the DNR Sporting Goods and Harborview Optometry parking lot. Um, so this one is, it's got a lot more layers to it. It's engineered. Um, there's a lot more thought put into the soil and the material and the mixture because this one has an element of water treatment in it as well. So it's pulling water in or, or accepting water in from the parking lot, which could have all kinds of contaminants, motor oil, that kind of thing. So the water actually passes through more rigorous um, water treatment system before entering this facility here and then it allows that water to be captured and alleviate some of the burden from the parking lot. Um, so this is something that you might see around the city. There's been a lot of different installations over the years from the city of Thunder Bay, including this one, um, but there's some at the Friendship Gardens. Um, there's some along Mythicker Creek that have been going in in stages. So these are all uh, municipal initiatives to essentially accomplish a very similar goal and that's to manage stormwater coming off of larger catchment areas like um, streets and, and um, sidewalks and that kind of thing and parking lots. So why are they important? We've reviewed a few of these um, points already, but again, rain gardens can be really wonderful tools to recharge groundwater and restore the water cycle in natural ways. Um, they can, you know, if you put enough of them together, you may see an impact on a neighborhood or a cluster of homes, example, uh, from localized flooding and drainage problems. And that's another thing too. I mean, there is the benefit of, you know, holding water back, managing it on your property, utilizing it for the way that nature intended essentially. 
Um, but this also will help to perhaps alleviate some lot level drainage issues that you might have. You might have some erosion issues on your property. You might have water pooling somewhere where you don't want it to. Um, there are some different reasons, not only just alleviating the burden on the municipal system, but even just improving the drainage on your, on your own property. Um, also, they can help to keep local waterways clean, again, by reducing that volume of stormwater, allowing it to soak into, your, into the ground rather than running off and picking up contaminants along the way. And then also because we're planting perennial species, plants that come back year after year, there's habitat for birds, butterflies, and other insects. So we'll go into the rain garden rebate program, and this is going to talk about um, the city of Thunder Bay program here. So again, this is open to, to residents of the city. Um, and usually what we do is, you know, if you submit an application, we'll follow up with a site visit um, to talk about your project before you begin. And so this is our team of, of Eco Superior staff in years past who were part of that process. So the funding and requirements, you can look at your brochure that you got in the resource package um, and it outlines some of the basics of the program. So again, it'll fund up to $500 in a rebate. So the expenses come out first, you install your rain garden, and then you can receive a rebate in the form of a check from the city um, or from Eco Superior, basically, uh, for up to $500 for planting supplies. If you go beyond that, then, you know, that that's to the, the owner. Um, or the, you know, the installer. Um, and if it goes under that, then it's just up to whatever that amount is, basically. Um, and the rain garden has to be installed again on a residential property within the city of Thunder Bay. Um, and the program is funded by the city of Thunder Bay. And this is a photo of an early stage, I think a first year rain garden that was installed on Monroe Street. It was actually part of one of our rain garden tours, which is an annual program that happens generally in early September. Um, so it's a really good learning tool where, you know, if you're thinking about starting a rain garden, it's an excellent opportunity to see what other people in the city have done. Um, we try to get a nice mix of early first year rain gardens as well as more seasoned rain gardens that have been established for a few years just to get a sense of what they might look like. Um, and again, it's a great opportunity to chat with homeowners about how they might have solved some drainage issues, how they might have beautified, beautified their landscape, um, and again, how they're preventing water from, you know, going down storm drains or running over their driveway. Um, there's all sorts of added benefits to creating a rain garden. So essentially what the procedure is you, you're in the process of completing step one. So usually we have our workshops in the spring. Um, we've done some online training as well in the past and this webinar is part of that. So your prerequisite to applying uh, for the rebate is to attend a webinar like you are tonight. So that's great. Um, and then, you know, we have an application form included in the resource package. We do ask that you give it some time to think about this. You know, it's still very early on. We're only in early May. Um, and so take a little bit of time to examine your property, think about what might work, what you've learned after this webinar, um, draw out a site plan and, and perhaps even a planting plan if you'd like, um, and just give it some thought before applying. And so we ask for about a week. Um, if that uh, sounds reasonable, then that's great. And then you can submit your application, which would include drawing a site plan, conducting an infiltration test and taking some measurements. So we'll go through that as well. And then discerning or uh, coming up with some calculations for sizing of the rain garden. So once we receive your application, uh, we'll give you a call and follow up and then we'll schedule a site visit. Um, so there are a limited number of rebates available. Typically competition is not, is not a really big issue, um, but they are first come first served. So it's great to get yours in sooner than, than later, I suppose, um, but we definitely get applications coming in, you know, throughout the season. And then we'll come stick around for about a half hour, 20 minutes um, to confirm your calculations, talk about, you know, plants that you might like to use, answer any questions you have at the time. And this is before you start your rain garden. Um, and then you'll receive approval if everything looks and sounds good. And uh, at that point, you are essentially, you know, locked into the program um, and you can move forward with your project. Now, having said that, um, step number five is to install your rain garden. 
Um, I can email out a list to anyone who's interested of qualified contractors who are, are participating in the program. So landscape contractors who are familiar with the program, uh, if you're interested in hiring one of them, they could install the rain garden for you. Uh, typically homeowners install the vast majority of rain gardens through this program, but there is that, that option. So if you are interested in that, I can send that out to you. And then we do ask that you make some progress with your rain garden within three weeks of the site visit date. And then to have your rain garden fully complete, that means you know functioning, planted, the whole lot within six weeks of the site visit. And that's just to ensure that we do use up our funds um, that are given to us within the calendar year, um, you know, that folks are actually able to utilize the available program funding um, just because it is based on a first come first serve basis. Um, so once you're complete with your rain garden, just contact us and we can book a post installation visit. At that point, we'll collect all of your receipts. We'll take an after photo of your completed rain garden. And then we work on um, submitting your paperwork and processing your, your rebate check. So here's the application form that we'll just go through um, quickly here. So the first part of the application is pretty straightforward. It's just your, your name, your basic contact information, um, the address that you'll be installing the rain garden on if it happens to be different from the one where you live. Um, just confirming that it is on City of Thunder Bay residential property. And the second is some eligibility requirements just in principle um, based on where the rain garden needs to go. So it's got to go um, at least three meters away from the foundation of the home. Um, we're, we're getting into some of the infiltration time and results in this section as well, which we'll review a little bit later, the type of soil. So um, those are questions that you'll have to answer. And then once you're finished with that, you can give us a basic sketch of your rain garden. It doesn't have to be too complicated, um, but essentially, you know, the more detail, the better. It really helps to think things through just in terms of, you know, existing trees or property lines or other features in your yard. Um, so that's a great opportunity to just run through that exercise before you submit your application. And here's an example of, of one that um, one applicant submitted to us some time ago. Um, so it's pretty detailed. Definitely not all applications come like this, but I thought this was a good example to show everybody. Um, so this is a front yard rain garden. Um, you see the applicant, she drew, you know, some, some very detailed measurements of the rooftop, where the veranda was, even distance, you know, from the home to her property lines. Um, she also noted where there were existing infrastructure and other features like trees, other pre-existing gardens, um, where the lawn was, the sidewalk, even the city sidewalk, those sorts of things, because those will all, you know, be taken into consideration when you're installing your rain garden. Any kind of trees or other existing features that you'll be, ex you know, installing your rain garden nearby could have an impact on that. Um, tree roots, for example, especially if you're excavating nearby those, you'll, you'll want to be careful. It could cause some difficulty. Um, so this is just a really good exercise, again, to, to think through your project. And if you happen to know at this time what you'd like to plant, please, you know, feel free to note that in the bottom corner, any kind of features or materials that you'll be using. Um, the more details, the better. But, um, you know, if you're not quite certain just yet, uh, that's okay. Um, and we'll go to the reverse of the application here. So this essentially mimics the worksheet, um, which you can find on page 17 of your manual, as well as the leaflet in your rain garden resource package. Um, and also I'd like to note too that more details on everything that we cover in this rain garden webinar can be found even more thoroughly explained in the manual. Essentially, this webinar is meant to reflect the information that you can find in there. So it's a really, really good reference tool to use once we finish up this evening and, and you know, while you're taking those days to think over your project. So the first section here is calculating the slope. And when we talk about that, we're talking about um, the grade of the lawn or you know, the landscape that you want to install your rain garden on. 
um, your rain garden itself, the basin is going to be relatively flat and level, but we're just, wanna, we're just concerned with what the landscape looks like prior to installation and how upland water flow is going to enter into your rain garden. Um, we're also going to talk about soils present and how to determine that, and also the infiltration test results. So um, how quickly does the water drain on the site that you want to install your rain garden? Um, the depth of the rain garden can also be calculated after that. And then we'll get into sizing your rain garden. How big does it need to be to capture the volume of water that's coming into it during um, an average rainfall? So those are all calculations that we'll go into detail with um, a little bit later. So eligible expenses for the rain garden rebate program. Um, Again, we do go for perennials here, so we're not going to fund annuals, uh, flowers, vegetables, that kind of thing. That's kind of out of the, out of the scope of the program here. Um, and so we encourage the use of native plant species. We speak a little bit broadly when it comes to this. Native plants can be plants that are found more broadly in this region, even including northern Minnesota or even prairie grasses. Um, the main principle or the main reasoning behind this is we just don't want to encourage invasive species. Um, and we also support the use of native plant species because of how well adapted they are to our regional growing conditions. And therefore, um, they're just going to improve the quality of your rain garden and its functioning over time. Um, and they're just really good for, you know, naturalizing habitat here as well. Um, so we say 50% native plant species. And what that means is um, you don't have to have 100% all native plant species in your rain garden. You can have hostas and, um, you know, other species as well that aren't necessarily native to here or this region. But we want them, we want your whole lot to at least be comprised of, of, of at least 50%. And then that way we'll fund you know, the full cost of your, of your plants, of course, up to $500, you know, including other landscaping supplies. Um, so that can include grasses as well. It can include um, trees and shrubs as well that are sort of part of your overall rain garden design. Soil amendments, if you have really dense, you know, clay soil or slower draining soil and you want to improve the drainage, you can add some sand. Um, if you're planting, by all means, adding some compost could be a good idea. Typically, native plants don't necessarily need a whole lot of additional nutrients, um, but you can also add some low clay topsoil, some triple mix. Um, if you need any amendments, those are eligible essentially for the, for the program. Um, if you're going to be purchasing any gravel or rock, river stones, stepping stones that are part of your rain garden design, um, the swale or the riverbed channel that's coming into your rain garden, typically folks have at least a few stones or more, um, but it's not integral at all. This is just um, a fairly inclusive list. Uh, any kind of edging or mulch is also eligible. And even if you wanted to include a rain barrel, um, and rain barrel accessories, um, you know, like a downspout extension, um, not a downspout extension, sorry, just a, an overflow extension. Um, so essentially anything beyond the downspout, um, and you'll see in a few example pictures a little bit later on of folks who have installed rain gardens with rain barrels included, and basically it's the overflow from the rain barrel that enters the rain garden. And then there's also perforated piping to help channel water into your rain garden if you don't really have that natural slope or that natural grade from your downspout into your rain garden. And stabilizing mat or burlap, um, if you wanna stabilize the, the berm, um, that's also eligible as well. Again, anything that's landscape or labor, unfortunately we don't fund as part of the $500 rebate. Uh, permeable pavers, tools or hardware, decorative ornaments, um, none of those are eligible as part of this program. You're welcome to use them if you like, but they won't be eligible as part of, as part of the expenses. So I'd just like to open it for questions. Just to, um, up to this point, we are going to go into rain garden design. Okay, I see that there's a chat here. So I'm gonna try to answer these live rather than typing. Okay, that's great. So approximately how much 
is the average rain garden. So there are some stats I'll bring into here a little bit later. By and large, there are folks who easily install a rain garden for $500 and all of their expenses are covered if they put it in themselves. Um, there are a little bit over half who might pay about $550. It really depends on the materials that you use. Certainly if you're installing and using cobblestone, heavy, heavy like rocks, boulders, those sorts of features. And also if you're using more expensive plants like shrubs or you know, $25 perennials, depending on how big your rain garden is, that can impact the cost for sure. Um, but we've seen many homeowners, you know, easily just meet the $500 mark and, and that's, that's worked really well. There's another one coming in here. Should my rain garden be three meters away from even a shed on a higher grade? Um, I don't think that would be a concern. Um, basically, what we want to avoid here is having it too close to the foundation of a basement, for example, where there would be uh, an issue with encouraging water to, to leak into the basement. So when water goes into the ground, sometimes it, it generally kind of mushrooms out. And we just want to make sure that there's enough of a buffer so that the foundation isn't um, impaired. Okay, so the next one is if we can't complete a rain garden this year, do we have to redo the seminar to qualify for the rebate? The good news is, is that uh, you don't have to redo the training. Um, certainly you're more than welcome to if you want a refresher, but if you've completed the training at one point and you want to install the rain garden in a subsequent year, that's no problem. Okay, so that one I have answered. Hopefully that makes sense. And let's see if there's anything else. Another one in the chat. Okay. Do you need to be the property owner to receive the rebate or can you do this on a property you're renting with the permission of the landlord? Um, yes, that should be fine. Um, basically, it would be the property owner who's probably going to receive the rebate. Um, although, it's, you know what, I, don't, I think it's okay. I don't think it really matters. It's as long as it's installed on the City of Thunder Bay property, then it should be fine. And of course, we wanna make sure that, yeah, there is permission from the landlord before that goes forward. There's another one here. Can we qualify for more than one property? Um, that's a good question. In the past, we have had, for example, landowners uh, or, or landlords who have wanted to install multiple rain gardens on property. We do that on a case-by-case -case basis. Certainly we um, want to encourage as many rain gardens as we can in the city, provided that they're being maintained and that they are um, exactly that being looked after. Um, we, what we don't wanna do is have rain gardens installed where you know, they just grow over and, and aren't looked after in subsequent years. Um, so we do look at that on a case-by-case -case basis, um, and we also kind of evaluate that as well, just to make sure that there's a fairness and distribution from year to year with different property owners who want to install a rain garden and participate in the program. Okay, it looks like there's no more questions coming forward at this point, so that's great. We'll go into uh, the next section of our program here. Oh, there's one more. Let's see, are the downspouts all connected to the garden? Um, not all downspouts. Uh, essentially, the rain garden usually captures water from one downspout. Um, this could be from the rooftop of, you know, part of a home or part of a garage, part of a shed. Um, we do generally, conventionally speaking, have rain gardens that are, you know, capturing water from a hard surface like that. Um, I hope that answers your question there. Oh, one more question coming in. Okay, I, yeah, can you qualify for more than one rain garden? All right, I am gonna answer that one live. We can qualify for more than one rain garden. Um, if this is talking about more than one on your property, uh, no, it's currently limited to one rebate per property, per household. Um, we've definitely had folks who have wanted to install multiple rain gardens on their property with one rebate. Um, and that's just what the limitations are right now. Um, another person asks, is there a timeline 
after the training, sooner the better. Well, uh, rain garden applications are received on a first come first serve basis, but we do ask that you wait um, one week after your rain garden webinar, so one week after this date, to submit your application to Eco Superior. Um, certainly, the sooner the better. I think it's a great idea. We we tend to get most of our interest in um, first uh, in the in the early part of the season, and then it sort of tapers off a little bit throughout the year. Okay, so I have answered that one live, and that one has been answered as well. Okay, one more question here. Right, so can you put a rain garden on the boulevard? This will be my last question for now because we'll just want to move into some of the design uh, specifics of rain gardens. Um, we have contacted the city about this. Last time we did check in, um, there was some hesitation and not support um, from the city's end about installing a rain garden on the boulevard because it is city of Thunder Bay property. Um, there were concerns about you know things like insurance and liability um, and that just didn't seem to be a road that the city wants to go down at this time. Um, so yeah that's basically how I'm going to answer that one. It's going to have to be just on your side of the property um, but you know, if there's a specific situation that you have, and you know, we could maybe look into it a little bit more. But the last time we did put that question to the city, that was their response. All right, so we'll go ahead now to the next part, and that's design and installation of rain gardens. So this is what I find to be a little bit more exciting. So you can follow along in, in your rain garden manual. And there's one section where we talk about plant hardiness zones. And if you're unfamiliar about with, with plant hardiness zones, it's essentially the, you know, the country, the geography of our region um, is divided up into what they call planting zones or plant hardiness zones. And this basically acts as a guide to let you know what kind of vegetation will survive in, you know, year after year through our winters. Um, and if you go to a landscape, like a, a nursery, a garden nursery, typically the planting tags that you look at will have zones attached to um, those particular varieties. They're not always really accurate. Um, and you kind of have to go off of some experience, you know, yourself or through people that you know. Um, not everything that may appear zoned for our region may survive. Um, but then on the other hand, there's other little microclimates that we have in our region here that have little warmer pockets. Um, so we're typically in the zone three planting plant hardiness zone region in Thunder Bay. And it's a good idea just to, to, to um, just have a concept of this when it comes to shopping for, for perennials, um, because certainly not everything that you might find in the nursery here is is going to do really well year after year. But again, with plants that are typically found in our, in our region, um, they have a really good chance of survival. And understanding water flow on your property. So we've kind of touched on our, our overall geography and you know, planting zones, but looking at how water behaves on your property is also gonna lend you a lot of clues as to what you can do in terms of augmenting the way that water flows. Um, and if you haven't already, I'd suggest taking a walk around your, you know, around your property, around your downspouts, your driveway, et cetera, and just observing how water behaves in a big rainfall, where it goes, um, where does it land, where does it want to move that help that might help explain, you know, those wet spots that you've got in your yard or perhaps some erosion issues. Um, and by and large, you know, water takes the path of least, least resistance. So the slope and the grade of your landscape is really going to determine where that water is going to flow and where it's going to end up, especially if you've got some low points in your yard. Um, so again, just getting a better sense of your surroundings and your property might offer some clues as to, you know, where a rain garden um, might best be situated. So where, where should it go? These are sort of really um, hard line general rules of thumb of where the rain garden is best located on your property. And again, as, as someone had asked about being three meters away from building foundations, it's really the foundation that we're concerned about. Um, I have heard 
a rain garden ecologist who suggested, you know, keeping your rain garden like the settling point of your rain garden, so where the, where the water is going to be captured and where it's going to sit, even keeping that away from, you know, your driveway or sidewalks, those sorts of areas where um, if that water, that water might encourage heaving, you know, of, of stones and that kind of thing. So you do want to be aware of those areas, but certainly around basement foundations and your home. Because again, when water soaks into the ground, it doesn't go straight down, it kind of mushrooms out. And so we just want to make sure that there's enough of a barrier or a buffer um, so that you don't get issues with your basement and with your septic system as well. We don't want any complications associated with that. Um, a gravity feed is ideal. So as you can see in this in this diagram below, a gentle slope away from your foundation. The water, naturally taking water away from your home is ideal. Certainly doesn't happen in Thunder Bay a lot of the time. Um, I know in my neighborhood, there's a lot of low set homes on a hillside and they're, you know, the last things to dry up in, in, the, in the springtime. And that's another thing to keep in mind too is, you know, not all properties are ideal places for rain gardens. That's what you might come away with after this webinar is, hmm, I learned a lot, but I also learned that maybe a rain garden just isn't going to help with my drainage issues here because we do have to look at, you know, what your landscape is doing to begin with, where water is flowing, you know, where your house is situated, um, the slope of your land, all those sorts of things. Um, and hopefully it's, it's something that will help. Um, but it does have to just, you know, keep in line with the principles of where water is flowing and, and what it's doing. So if you happen to have a low point or like a wet patch in your yard, positioning a rain garden above that could, you know, help dry that space out. Um, so that might be another consideration for you as well um, in terms of locating the rain garden. And so when you're considering existing land use, um, these are three points that you definitely would want to keep in mind. Um, so before you start excavating and digging into your ground, you'll want to know where your utility locates are. Do you have a gas line or a water line running somewhere nearby that might cause you some trouble? Um, what about, you know, play areas, foot traffic, you know, the pathway for mowing and maintenance, um, getting over to your gazebo or your deck? something like that. Um, so considering how you're using your land already and how a rain garden might enhance that or, you know, just play a role in those other features. Um, so sizing your rain garden basically depends on a few different factors. Um, certainly the type of soils that your rain garden will be planted in. If you have really sandy soil, quick draining soil, that could mean that you don't have to build a really large rain garden. You know, basically with the water is going to disappear fairly quickly. Um, you can make it a little bit smaller. You could possibly make it a little bit deeper. Um, it doesn't have to take up as much room as say, if you had denser soils or slightly slower draining soil, um, you're gonna have to increase the size of your rain garden or you know, just decrease the, the, um, the amount of water flowing into it. Um, that also ties in with the finished depth of the rain garden. So again, if you have quicker draining soils, you could make your rain garden a little bit deeper. Um, again, if you have um, more dense soils, then, then you can make it a little bit greater in, in surface area and um, more shallow. And so it also a, a really big factor as well is, you know, how large is the area of the hard surface? that's draining into your rain garden. So do you have a really big rooftop that you want to, you know, drain into a rain garden? Or is it maybe just part of your front patio or your veranda? So the size of your rain garden is going to be essentially proportionate to, you know, the, what we call the, the drainage area, the size of the rooftop or the hard surface that is going to be feeding your rain garden. So the first step, um, and we'll be getting into some sizing calculations on our worksheet in a little bit, is calculating the slope. So I just wanted to really clarify here that we're not talking about the finished slope of the rain garden, because you can see in this top illustration here, the bottom of your rain garden, the sort of basin, the lowest point, 
is relatively flat and that's basically going to ensure even distribution of water once it enters your rain garden. What we're talking about is the grade of the lawn or the land um, that you want to install your rain garden on. And that's basically the concern with this one is, is we want to essentially see how water is going to flow into your rain garden. If you have a really steep slope, um, then you're going to get water coming in really quickly. Then you're going to have issues with washout, potentially with erosion and all sorts of complications that just would probably not make it a good fit for a rain garden in that circumstance. So calculating the slope is a good first step to determining if, you know, in fact, this is a good location for your rain garden. So your required materials would be a couple of stakes, just bamboo stakes or wooden stakes, um, some string that's long enough to run in between them, a tape measure, a level, just a regular carpenter's level should be fine enough, and a basic calculator. And so when we're calculating the slope, a grade of roughly four to eight percent is really ideal. Certainly there's a lot of lots in Thunder Bay that are essentially have no slope, you know, running from the down, the downspout into the yard. Um, and there's some ways to work around that, for instance, having a pipe that would basically help channel water into the rain garden in those circumstances. Um, but if we're looking at something over a 12% grade, you know, you're either going to have to get some kind of professional consultation or help. Um, and it's just generally not a, an ideal spot to be putting a rain garden in. So for calculating a slope, what we're going to do is we're going to take two strings. We're going to have an uphill stake. So again, this is in a circumstance where you have a, a slope away from your home and you have a gentle grade and you're going to plant a stake roughly in the uphill part and then picturing your rain garden kind of going in between these two stakes. You're going to plant one uphill and then you're going to plant another stake just below where you plan to have your rain garden. And generally we like to have about five meters in between these two stakes, roughly speaking. Okay, so that'll be your first step. And then you're going to take a string and you're going to run it in between these two stakes. You're going to put the, the uphill stake, um, the string around there. You're going to want to basically put it fairly flush with the ground. And then you're going to want to run that string to the stake on the lower part and make sure that it's level. So you'll use your carpenter's level and more or less just find, you know, a string. It might be uh, um, a level point. It might be a little bit easier with um, another person helping you out. So then what you're going to have is we've indicated in this diagram here, there's what we call the width, but I like to call it um, the run. So it's the distance between these two stakes. And then there's the other measurement here, which is indicated as the height, but you can call it the rise. And that's the distance from the ground on the lower stake to the level part of that string. Okay, and then we're going to use those two measurements to calculate the slope. So for example, we have a measured distance between the two stakes, again, five meters, which is our run. And then we're going to look at the distance between the ground and that string on the lower end. And we're working in metric here. I know some folks are in imperial. We tried to make a balance of both um, in the manual, but we're just gonna do metric in this instance. Um, and working in meters, we're gonna say 0.3. So it's a foot or 30 centimeters. Now we're gonna take our rise and divide it by the run. And that gives us in this instance 0 0.06. We're gonna multiply that by 100 and in this case, we'll have a 6% slope. So great, we're falling in between our 4 and 8%. Again, that's not needed, but it certainly indicates an ideal slope in this situation here. Okay, so I'll just leave that up for a couple extra minutes, or seconds rather. Now, step two. So we're going to go through this in a group exercise again. So if you know, at any point we're losing you in the math, it's okay, we'll, we'll review it again in a different exercise. Um, the second step is to check your soil and determine the depth of your rain garden. So at this point, we're looking at how quickly the water is going to drain in your existing soils. We wanna make sure that again, with the rain garden, we're not creating a pond. We don't like standing water for too long. There's all sorts of issues that come out of that um, when it comes to breeding mosquitoes or drowning your plants. 
Um, so we want to make sure that that water is going to disappear and infiltrate into the soil within about 24 hours. That's kind of the ideal time frame. So we're going to check our soil. Um, if you've got something that's really coarse and gritty, pretty sure more than likely it's going to be really sandy soil and that's your quick draining soil. Water is going to disappear fairly quickly in that situation. On the other end of the spectrum, you might have really dense, sticky, clumpy clay, you know, lots of um, compaction maybe in your yard as well, that, that wouldn't help either. But if you've got, you know, clumpy clay-like soil, um, you might have to amend it with perhaps some sand um, or even some other additional measures that's gonna increase, you know, the ability of, of that area to, um, to drain water more quickly. Um, so it's not really an ideal material to make a rain garden, but it could also just mean that you're making one with a larger surface area. So there's just more um, area to, to gather rainwater and allow it to soak into the ground. Really ideally is having silty or kind of loamy soil. Um, it's kind of a mixture of everything, but it's nice and smooth. It's not sticky. If you make it into a ball, um, you know, if you tap on it a little bit, it'll just fall apart. It's not really going to hold its shape too well. And this has pretty good draining um, soil as well. So doing an infiltration test, this is what we really um, need you to do prior to applying because it really is a good indicator as to, you know, the viability of that particular site for a rain garden. And it's going to, it's just going to show you a lot of different things and it's a good practice to do. Um, so you'll want to start by looking at the area that's going to be your rain garden um, where there's, it's kind of the low point of your rain garden, where the water is going to be captured and where it's going to settle. So at that site, roughly, you'll want to dig a hole about 20 centimeters across and 20 centimeters deep, just the depth of a spade shovel should be fine. And then you'll want to fill it with water and you'll want to let it drain. Um, this is to make sure that the whole area is generally saturated, okay? Because um, if the soil is really dry, it won't really give you a good indication of how quickly that water will drain in a more saturated, wet, kind of rainy um, situation. So you might want to wait one to two hours minimum. Maybe the water will be gone by that time, um, but usually around the two hour mark, that should be sufficient um, to saturate the, the ground nearby. Um, so it's up to you. You can let it drain fully or just wait a couple hours. Then you'll want to fill it again and then mark with the popsicle stick. You can see in that photo the starting water level. And then at that time you want to record the time, you know, say it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and then you'll want to come back at regular intervals, say every two hours or every four hours, um, and then just see how long it takes or how much the water has dropped at that point, okay? So this calculation or these notes are gonna help you with your infiltration test calculation um, to determine how deep your rain garden needs to be. And then also another important thing is that you'll wanna come back at the same time the next day, so say 10 o'clock the next, the next morning, and just make sure that that water has completely drained in a 24 hour period. And that'll just tell you that, okay, this is a good site um, maybe my water is draining fairly slow, maybe it's pretty quick, um, but definitely I know that the water has disappeared within a day and, you know, we're not going to have um, issues in the future with the rain garden. So here's an example of the infiltration test calculation. Now this is, again, we tried to do metric, we tried to do imperial, you know, to make everybody happy. So hopefully it's not too convoluted. But for example, if you um, noticed that there was about an inch of water draining, so say 2.5 centimeters in a four hour period, we need to figure out how many centimeters or inches it's draining within a day, within a 24 hour period. So if you had one inch over four hours, you're going to look at over 24 hours, there's a factor of six. So 24 divided by four, you have a factor of six. And so that's going to show you that water is draining 15 centimeters in a 24 hour period, six inches in a day. Okay. So this infiltration rate is going to ultimately be the depth of your rain garden. 
And this is sort of the ultimate depth. We're going to have sloping sides of your rain garden as well in the sort of outer berm, but that like real kind of low level point of your rain garden, the kind of basin part um, is, is going to be in this case six inches or 15 centimeters, okay? So now let's do a group exercise. Um, we're going to go through a scenario and then with our worksheets, fill out the first section of, of, the, um, of the worksheet. So, oops, those are answers. Um, so we'll go through the first section here. So just take out your worksheet if you have it. That's great. If pencil and eraser, calculator is what you'll need. So the first part is Karen wants to install a front yard rain garden to collect water from the rooftop of her home. The front yard slopes away from her house, so that's all fine and well. And the measurement from above her rain garden site, so that upper area, to the lower area, so she's planting those two stakes, is approximately five meters. So that's your run, the distance between those two stakes. Now the distance between the ground and the level string on the lower end is 0.4 meters. So that's your rise. So this is the information that you use to calculate your slope. Second point is that the soil is silty, so she's got pretty good moderate drainage. An infiltration test indicates a drainage rate of five centimeters or two inches every six hours. And then she came back the next day at the same time and noticed that the test hole drains completely within 24 hours. So we'll have to figure out how many centimeters or inches are draining in a 24 hour period. Okay, so using the worksheet, determine the slope of land in Karen's yard and calculate the depth of her rain garden based on the infiltration test. So again, on your worksheet, I'm just gonna give you a few minutes to calculate the slope. Um, you can note the soils present and the infiltration test results and the rain garden depth. Um, if you've already started, that's great, but I did wanna just kind of note here, the infiltration test results, you'll see there's letter values there and what you're going to do is you're going to just plug in, you know, A and B, and then those values will carry on through the steps and they'll inform your calculations as you go, you know, through steps one, two, three, and eventually determining your rain garden depth. Okay. Um, so I'll let you do that and we'll come back in a couple minutes. And maybe if some folks are done, you can just raise your hand when you're finished and then that way I'll know when we can move on. All right, okay, so I have a fair number of people who have raised their hand, that's great. Um, so if we're not quite, if not everyone quite is there yet, good, we're, um, we'll just review the answers together, okay? So let's see here. These are the answers. So again, we have the measured distance between the two stakes, which is our run, so that's our five meters distance between the ground and the string on the lower end, so that, that lower stake um, is 0.4, so we're working in metric. 
So our rise over our run, 0.4 divided by 5, gives us 0 0.08 multiplied by 100, 8% slope. Conveniently, that's great. So this is going to work as far as the slope is concerned. The soil's pleasant present were silty, loamy, um, right around that kind of middle area. Um, so that's also very good and quite ideal. All right, so the rain garden depth. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense for everybody. I'll just leave that up for an extra second. Okay. All right, so getting into the second part here, we're going to look at our infiltration test results. This is where it gets a little bit tricky, but hopefully, you know, if you do it once and then you do it again, it'll be no problem, especially because when you're going to work on your own rain garden application, this will give you a, a, another chance to work through it. So again, we were looking at a drainage rate of five centimeters in a period of six hours. Okay, so we wanted to find out, you know, how many centimeters will it drain in a 24 hour period? Well, there's a factor of four in there, right? So 24 divided by six. So carrying that B value down into number two gives us uh, the number four. Then carrying C into step three, we've got four multiplied by five. That gives us 20. So that's gonna be our rain garden depth. And a good note about this is um, I've tried to make it um, noted on, on the side here in that little box is that if you have moderately well draining soil and especially if it's fast draining soil, um, when you do your own infiltration tests at home, you could come up with a really, really high infiltration rate. You know, it might tell you that, oh, your rain garden can be like a meter deep or something crazy like that. Um, so that's a good thing in a way. It sort of tells you that, okay, I could make you know, a rain garden here, it's not going to pond and have standing water, but you don't want to make your rain garden too deep. Um, if you have a larger rain garden, for example, maybe somewhere between six and eight square meters, maybe 30 centimeters as the ultimate depth is going to be okay. But if you have a small rain garden and you have, you know, say a 30 centimeter depth, it's going to look a bit like a hole in the ground. You know, we don't want that. We don't want it to be a tripping hazard or anything like that. And so generally speaking, um, it's nice to work off of a 20 centimeter depth of a rain garden. Um, so you can just use that number as well if that's your preferred garden depth. It's a nice shallow depression. It doesn't look too different or distinguish, distinguished from the rest of your yard. Um, but by all means, you know, you can do up to 30 centimeters. I just wouldn't recommend going anywhere beyond that. Okay. All right, so step three is determining the drainage area. This is a little bit more math. Um, and again, I'm going to go through with it. If it doesn't make sense, it's okay. Um, hopefully you can follow along. But again, if you follow um, through the worksheet again with your own application in your own kind of home context, um, that might be a good opportunity to run through it yourself. So again, the drainage area is, is the total surface area that is draining into your rain garden. So it's, it's what's feeding your rain garden. It could be, you know, in this instance here, um, a parking lot or a sidewalk or, you know, a road. Sometimes there's, there's what engineers call the catchment area. So that's all the water that's falling onto this hard impervious surface and feeding, you know, these stormwater management um, facilities. In a residential context, it'll probably be, you know, the rooftop of your shed or a portion of your home, you know, or a portion of your, you know, your veranda or your front porch. Okay, so that's what we're talking about when we're, we're talking about the drainage area. Okay, and that largely will help us in calculating um, how big or small the rain garden needs to be. So when we calculate the drainage area, it's a really good idea to, to take a look around your house, take a walk around, and just give a rough estimate as to what percentage of the roof flows into the downspout that's going to be feeding your rain garden. So typically with rain gardens, they're usually connected to, you know, one area of your home or one area of the building. They're not taking all of the water 
from you know every part of the rooftop unless you engineer it that way you can but typically you know in this diagram here we're looking at a home that has four downspouts you know a couple of rain gardens each you know capturing water from a portion of that roof based on which downspout is feeding it so you want to estimate you know if you've got say four downspouts you'll estimate the percentage of roof that flows into the downspout that's feeding your rain garden so it could be say 25 percent or about a quarter or if you have two downspouts you'll estimate well this rain garden is taking water from one and so it's going to take about half 50 percent okay and then the next step is you're going to find your home's footprint so that's the total area of the first floor of your home in again in our version it's going to be square meters so it's walking around your house it's measuring the width and the length and again this isn't an exact science it's just an approximation so we have a fairly good idea of the size of your rain garden okay um, so again just measuring the length and the width if you've got some really funky features you know do the best that you can but um, just get a good a good guess okay and then you're going to multiply that total roof area, so that total number, by the percentage of the roof that feeds into the rain garden downspout. And in many situations, it might be 50% if you have, you know, um, two downspouts and half of that water is going into your rain garden. Or it might be 25%, or it might be a third, you know, if you have three downspouts and it's only taking a third. Okay, so we'll go through this again in, um, this example here and then we'll do another example in our worksheet. So drainage area calculations. So we've got Susan's house and it measures a footprint of 10 meters by 20 meters. So the roof area is approximately 200 square meters total. Okay, that's the whole thing. And then, you know, she's taking a walk around her house and she's estimating that the downspout that she wants to feed her rain garden with only collects about 25% of the roof, okay? So maybe she's got four downspouts on her house total, one on each corner, and she's gonna bring about a quarter of that water through that downspout into her rain garden, okay? So that's where we're gonna calculate your total area, which is 200, multiplied by, we're gonna convert that to a decimal, right? So 25% is gonna become 0 0.25, so essentially it's gonna be a quarter, okay? So 50 square meters of roof drainage area. I hope I explained that all right so that we can all follow along. Okay. All right, so from there, we're gonna determine the area of the rain garden, the surface area. Okay, so we're going to basically surmise that we're going to size the rain garden to hold about an inch of rain that falls on the area of hard surface draining to the rain garden. Okay, so, you know, with rain gardens, you're going to have some days where it doesn't rain very much. You know, you're going to have some days where there's a really big rainfall and maybe your garden is going to be um, at capacity and maybe even overflowing. Um, the real benefit of the rain gardens are to really slow that water down and hold it back so that, you know, all of a sudden we don't have everybody's downspouts, you know, just churning and flowing and throwing water, you know, down the streets and down our driveways. Holding that water back and slowing it down is really what we want to be doing. So even if our rainwater isn't capturing all of everything, you know, all of that water that's coming into it from that downspout, um, it's really doing a, a, you know, a good job of holding some of it back. Okay, and this calculation too, um, sizing the rain garden to hold about an inch, is a really good starting point for sizing rain gardens in a residential context, but certainly we don't want to consider it, or consider it an absolute rule for, um, you know, sizing rain gardens and low impact development for parking lots and streets and roads. Um, there's a lot more complexities, you know, involved in, in those calculations, but for our very small kind of basic introductory rain garden level in a residential context, we can go through these um, calculations and we should come out with, with a perfectly adequate rain garden size. Okay, so rain garden sizing calculation. This is where it gets a little bit funny. Um, and to be honest with you, we had, you know, the engineering department from the city of Thunder Bay help us along with developing these calculations in the manual. So I assure you, even if you don't understand it, just plug the values in 
and follow it step by step and you should get a number that will make sense in the end. So we'll start off with that. Um, so say Susan's roof area, her drainage area is 50 square meters. Okay, so she's got a quarter of her roof, remember, coming into that one rain garden from that one downspout. And then we're gonna say that Susan ran an infiltration test on her soil and she found that 15 centimeters or six inches of water soaks into the ground in a 24 hour period per day, okay? So this means that her rain garden should be 15 centimeters deep, okay, which is, you know, in millimeters, 150 or six inches. We tried to give all those calculations or conversions. So now if the goal of the rain garden is to capture one inch or 25 millimeters of runoff from her roof, her garden can be one sixth the area of her roof, okay? And so that's going to be calculated as what we call the footprint ratio. And what you're going to do is you're going to put your target rainfall, so it's that first inch per day on top, and then you're going to divide it by the measured infiltration rate, okay? So that's going to be the value of what you're getting from your infiltration test. And then it's going to spit out a fraction, and in this case it's one-sixth. So this means that the size of the rain garden should be one-sixth of her drainage area, okay? Um, now again, if this is not following along, it's okay, we'll work it out. So in this case, we've got the rain garden footprint, which essentially is the rain, the drainage area multiplied by the footprint ratio. Now here it's expressed as, as a division, like as a fraction, but it'll spit out the same number anyway. So we've got 50 square meters over six, so over the, over the one sixth, and that's gonna allow us to calculate uh, a roughly eight square meters of garden. So we want to round to the nearest whole number here, which means that Susan's garden area is going to be about eight square meters. So she has 50 square meters of drainage area and she's got an infiltration rate of um, 15 centimeters, then it's going to mean that she needs to have an, uh, a rain garden of eight square meters. And again, in the worksheet, we tried to make it very step by step. So hopefully it's just a matter of plugging in the values where the letters are and then following along and carrying them through the equations and the steps and then you should come out with um, your rain garden number, okay? So we're gonna do a quick calculation right now which is the last part of the worksheet. Okay, and we'll go through Karen's rain garden again. Okay, so Karen's house has two downspouts, one at the front corner of the house and another at the back corner. And each of them collect about half of the total runoff from the roof, all right? So we've got 50% in the back, 50% in the front. Now her rain garden is gonna capture from the front downspout only, okay? So we're only looking at half of that water. And the house measures, so she walked around and she measured about eight meters wide and 12 meters long, okay? So using the worksheet, calculate the footprint ratio and then determine the area of Karen's rain garden. So steps one and two, you'll see is actually the same calculation. It's just kind of condensed in step number two. So what you wanna do is take that um, 20 centimeters that you calculated as the rain garden depth, that's your D value. You wanna carry that down and plug it into the D value for step number one under footprint ratio, okay? And then that'll give you your E, which will fill in um, step number two, or number two in the footprint ratio, and then you can just use your um, footprint calculations, eight by 12 um, for the rain garden area. Okay, so I'll just give you a couple minutes, a few minutes to, to work that out. And then again, when folks are finishing up, um, just raise your hand. Okay, thanks. Okay. 
All right, so it looks like we've got a fair number of people who are raising their hand indicating that they're done. Um, so that's great, right on. So we'll carry on with the answers, okay? Um, so again, we brought our D value down from the rain garden depth and we plugged that into um, the footprint ratio. So we had 2.5 centimeters over 20 centimeters a day. Again, bring that over to number two. Uh, it's sort of just a condensed version of the same calculation. So 2.5 over 20, that gives us our E value, which is 0 0.125. Okay, so that's going to be our factor that we'll use a little bit later. Now we're going to go with the, the rain garden area. So the footprint of the Homer building, again, it was the total of Karen's house is 96 square meters. Okay. Now we're going to look at the percentage of the roof area that feeds into her rain garden from that one downspout. Now it's 50%, but we need to express this as a decimal. Okay, and that's what I tried to just note in the bottom there. So we don't multiply by 50 in the next step, we multiply by 0.5, so half. So again, 96, which is your F, multiplied by your G, which is 0 0.5, gives you 48. So it's half of that um, total roof area. Now we're going to bring that H down and calculate our drainage area multiplied by our footprint ratio. So our 48 multiplied by our E value, which is 0.125. And that's going to calculate a rain garden area of six square meters. Okay. And that's a pretty average size rain garden. Certainly it can be smaller than that. If you've got a smaller area, it can be much larger. We'll look into some stats in a little bit about what some of the average sizes are for residential rain gardens in Thunder Bay. Um, but that's basically the worksheet completed and um, you know the same calculations that you've got on the application form. So hopefully you found that helpful. And now we'll get out of sort of those technical uh, considerations for the sizing calculations and just look at some of the shapes to consider. So I mean, by all means, um, you can plant a rain garden in the, in the middle of your yard. It can be a nice oval or a circle. You know, it's capturing water from your downspout. It's doing everything that a rain garden should do. And that's perfectly fine. Many people have made rain gardens like that. Um, but then you'll, you might also want to consider, you know, how does the rain garden fit in with the rest of my front yard or my backyard? You know, am I going to be landscaping my entire front yard and do I want to make it look something like what's in this picture here? Um, so those are just some design considerations, you know, based on what you've got going on in your yard already. You can consider, you know, kind of nice contours like a kidney shape or a teardrop um, or any kind of similar versions that fit with the existing landscape. Okay. So we'll have a gallery of, of rain gardens um, coming up towards the very end here, just to give you a little bit of inspiration. Um, and then also these are some additional features that you'll probably be working into your rain garden. So if you're putting your rain garden in um, a bit of a slope, you know, uh, of your lawn, you know, a grade away from your home, for instance, you're gonna wanna make the interior of your rain garden, that bottom bit, level, you know, again, to ensure like an even distribution of water. But what that means is that you're going to need to uh, create a berm on the lower section of that rain garden to hold water in. Okay, so that's when you essentially excavate your material and then you build up that lower, those lower um, edges of your rain garden. Okay, and then you compact that down. Um, so that's essentially a berm. It's that kind of retaining wall. Um, and then there's also inlets and outlets. Okay, so if you're using any kind of perforated pipe to convey water into your rain garden, um, that could be surrounded by a cobble kind of feature. And that's basically to dissipate the water so that you're not flushing, you know, like a rush of water into your rain garden and washing out your plants and washing out your mulch. It's a nice kind of what we would call like a pretreatment. And then also an outlet. So if your rain garden in a really, really heavy storm um, is at capacity, we don't want it overflowing over all of the edges of your berm and then washing out your mulch and washing out your plants. What you might want to consider, in fact, I would really um, suggest you consider is an outlet. And there's a photo of an outlet that I'll show you in, in an upcoming slide. So that's essentially the, the reverse. So it's water flowing out. There's some cobble or river rock in that little kind of divoted area of your of your berm and that basically allows water to flow out but to keep you know the mulch and the soil and your debris um, in the rain garden okay 
Um, so that's that, and you can consider a swale, which is essentially like a nice little dry creek bed or a grassed swale, essentially some kind of conveyance channel to get that water from the downspout into your rain garden. So how to install a rain garden? So there's a few steps here. Um, preparing the soil and garden bed. So the first thing that you'll want to do before you start excavating is call Ontario One Call. Um, that's their website there. You can file a ticket online. You can also call them by their 1-800 number. Um, we definitely encourage that as the very first step, just so you have an idea of where any possible utility locates are before you start putting a shovel in the ground. Um, a few basic tools that you'll need that would be really helpful, a tape measure, a rope or a garden hose, just to kind of map out the edges of your rain garden before you start digging so you can play around with the shape and the size. Um, a spade shovel and a lawn edger are really, really good tools to use. Hard and soft rake for leveling the rain garden and, you know, doing some, some finessing of the slopes would be really handy. Um, a hand trowel for planting, so when it comes time to put your perennials in the ground. Um, a level, wooden stakes and string, again, for calculating the slope. A two by four board can be really handy for making sure that the lower kind of basin part of your rain garden is, um, is level. And then again, if you did want to put in a berm on those lower outer edges, you can, you can compact it with a tamp or you can simply stomp on the berm. That works just as well. So now laying out the garden, um, again, using a rope or maybe even a garden hose, you can see very faintly there's a yellow rope um, on this rain garden. So before they started it, they outlined where it was going to go and then they started to dig it up and remove the grass. So you can do that by hand. Um, if you wanted to rent a sod cutter, you could, but certainly um, you can just dig it up if you want. And just make sure that you've got all the grass removed. You don't really want uh, too much of an issue with grass growing through your rain garden. So you'll make sure that you've, you've really got that every, you know, every last bit out. Now getting water to the rain garden, again, there's a couple different ways to consider this. And I would, I would really refer to your manual in here because everything that I'm talking about just becomes, you know, even in more detail in, in the installation guide. So it's going to talk about inlets and, you know, channeling water into your rain garden. So this person on the left, they did like a perforated pipe, what we call maybe even like a weeping tile. It's just basically superficially buried. So it's going underneath that mulch and then it actually went under the grass. So they just cut out a section um, and then they put the grass back on top. And that's just basically for, you know, aesthetic features. They can run the mower over it, no problem. Um, and then again, there's the inlet where the water empties into, um, into the rain garden. In the other photo here, they have a rain barrel installed. They have an overflow hose. And so when that rain barrel overflows, they're having any excess water basically be channeled into their rain garden. And for them, they used more of like a cobble swale um, before going into the rain garden. Now, when you're shaping it, again, you're going to want to dig to the desired depth. In, in many cases, it could be about 20 centimeters. Um, then if you need to, you can amend the soil with compost or good soil. Um, you'll want to level the very bottom of the rain garden. Okay, so that's where you can take that two by four and, and run it across and just make sure that it's looking fairly level, especially if you're installing your rain garden um, on, you know, on a, a grade of, of lawn that's on a fairly, you know, obvious slope. So that would come in really handy. And then if you need to, you can add garden edging. Um, and then start uh, sculpting the sides of your rain garden. So where to put excavated material. So again, this is kind of looking at making your rain garden level. Um, and then when you have a slope that you're digging into, you're going to cut in and then you can, you know, remove that grass and then cut in below that and then basically build up your berm on the lower sides on the outer edges. Okay, and then the more of a steeper slope that you're working with, the deeper you're probably going to have to cut in. Um, but um, that's essentially what you'll be doing is just basically redistributing that material to other areas of your rain garden. So you don't necessarily have to haul it all away. Um, you can build it up into a different spot. Okay, and then I, I do see some questions, the odd question coming in, but I'll just wait until um, the very end if that's all right. So selecting plants, um, again, 
you'll want to look for perennial species. Um, it would be really great to have plants that are broadly speaking found in our greater region. Um, that could include trees, it could include shrubs, certainly perennial wildflowers, grasses and sedges. Um, and then, you know, like there is a lot to play around with. If you're an experienced gardener, you know, you'll want to consider the bloom times, the textures, the mature height. Um, and even if you haven't, if this is your first sort of pitch at, at gardening in general, um, it can be a really great project to have. But what I would recommend is just starting small, you know, select just a handful of species so that it's really simple. You get nice, you get like a nice palette of color and textures. And then you can even look at the different bloom times. You certainly might want to steer away from a rain garden that, you know, blooms in the early spring only. And then you just have, you know, dead flowers like the rest of the, the rest of the year. Um, but um, all of that information you can find on uh, the sort of last pages of our rain garden manual. We've got a good um, set of top 10 species that we would recommend for rain gardens. And then we've got another chart that goes into more detail for, for other varieties. Um, and then there's also moisture tolerances. So we'll get into that shortly. Basically what that means is that you've got varying depths of your rain garden. You have the berm, which is the outer kind of area, the outer walls of your rain garden, which are drier, and then gradually moving into the low point of your rain garden, which is where the water is going to settle. It's the deeper part of your rain garden. And so naturally you're going to want to select plants that are happy with growing in these various moisture zones, okay? So another thing for why to use native plants, um, they're really great to use because they have deep root systems. Uh, they help to break up the soil. They tend to be pretty drought hardy as well. So if we have a period where there's just not a lot of water, we don't have to worry about rushing over and you know irrigating them or fertilizing them. They're able to establish deep root systems that pull water up from deep under you know the soil. It could be even meters you know sometimes. Um, and because of that, you know, they require less care once they're established. You don't have to, you know, wrap them up or bury them or cover them with burlap. Generally speaking, um, they're pretty well adapted to our growing conditions. Um, and then also they provide valuable habitat for pollinators, you know, for wildlife around here um, that are biologically already adapted um, to, you know, certain species and certain flowers and things that grow around here naturally. So. Um, it's definitely a good case to look for plants that um, are found in this region. So again, as I was talking about a moment ago, plant moisture zones of a rain garden. So typically there's three of these. Um, and you want to make sure that you're selecting plants that can tolerate these zones. So in the interior here, you'll see the sort of darker green area that's the base. That's your really low point. And you'll see like the cross section of the rain garden below. And you know, the rain garden is sort of dish or saucer shaped. And so you've got your low point there. Those are gonna be plants that like really met, moist, wet conditions, marshy conditions, even in some cases, um, you know, for instance, like an iris, you know, or a swamp milkweed, they'll pre or a sedge even, they'll generally do like pretty good in those situations. Some people even choose um, just to put nothing there. You know, if you can't find a, a, a species that, you know, is really suited for that, if there's just not a lot of varieties available, but typically irises are, are um, a nice choice or other sedges. Um, then you've got the transition zone, I kind of call it. So that's your sloped areas. Um, and that's your transition zone between your deepest point of the rain garden and the outer edges. And that's kind of your moderate moisture zone. Then you've got your outer kind of berm or your outer edge of uh, your rain garden, your buffer zone. And that's where you're gonna wanna plant um, the type of perennials that can handle more drier, you know, growing conditions. And oftentimes you'll find that there's many different varieties of plants that will be happy in that sort of transition slope zone as well as the outer, the outer edge. So here's just a few selections. Um, you don't have to use these and it's just a starting point, but again, we do have more varieties that we recommend in our rain garden manual. So a few examples for the dry zone. So those are your top edges, your berm, your outside of your rain garden. We've got big blue stem, 
which is a grass. Um, Cytoat's grandma is another kind of grass as well. But then these two, the butterfly weed, the pleurisy root, um, which likes to handle fairly dry conditions, as well as the purple cone flower, the echinacea. Um, that's really popular around here. You can find purple cone flower in, in a lot of even different colors. So when we talk about native species or native plants, we will allow for cultivars. So that essentially means it's um, not quite the true native, but there's been some genetic modification in it, either with, you know, the color or the shape or the size. So for instance, there might be a white coneflower, um, you know, the powwow white or the uh, different types of bee balm, you know, that are, you know, more compact varieties or different colors. So if you're getting, um, you know, a bee balm, a monarda, but it's not quite the monarda fistulosa, which is like the native one to our region, even if you get a cultivar to that, that's still okay. That would count as your eligible expenses for your perennials. And then for the average zone, so this is your slopes, your kind of transition zone between your really deep points and your outer edges. You've got a lot of play here. I've only listed four, but there's many, many to choose from. That might include Blazing Star, your Lance Leaf Coreopsis, New England Aster, or your Obedient Plant. Um, the good thing about this, these, this area here is that, you know, generally speaking, you can probably play around with height and shape and color um, and size and you know oftentimes you can you can move these very plants into the outer berms and they'll do just fine um, so again just more information in the uh, the planting guide and the manual now this is where the palette tends to uh, be a little bit more limited especially for our planting plant hardiness zones there's not too many um, but certainly the blue flag iris or, you know, you'll find a lot of Siberian iris in the nurseries, um, that's okay. The swamp milkweed typically likes a sloped area or maybe even the lower area of your rain garden. Sedges will do just fine, so they're kind of like a grass but a little bit different. Um, and then there's the ferns, you know, ferns typically like, you know, moist areas, so they can be a good um, selection for the lower parts of your rain garden. And then another thing I wanted to mention too is that you can put your rain garden in a shady spot with a low sun exposure or you can put it in a really sunny spot. There's a few different planting plans at the back of our rain garden manuals that show you some examples of both. And just because you know, you're putting in a rain garden doesn't mean it has to be in a sunny location. As long as you've got plants that can tolerate whatever the sunlight conditions are in that area, and you know, provided that your drainage is, is adequate for a rain garden, then it should be no problem. So it, it doesn't really matter too much about whether you're planting in a sunny spot or a, or a shady one, or even a mix of both. So some of the statistics, um, we're getting towards the end here. We'll go in through a photo gallery, and then we'll get into a question and uh, answer period. Um, so the size of rain gardens over the years, we've found people generally range from between four to 12 square meters. 12 is quite large. It's a pretty big rain garden. That's a lot. Um, generally, I would say between eight and 10 square meters, even six. Six seems to be, you know, even lately we're getting more of those average lower numbers for rain gardens. And then the cost. Someone had asked earlier about how much does it cost to put in your average rain garden. By, you know, I do want to stress that it really does depend on the materials that you're putting in. If you're simply putting in a basic rain garden with perennial plants and some mulch, um, it's going to be on the lower end of the expenses, especially if it's a small rain garden. It really depends on the size as well. Um, it's when you get into the, the shrubs and the rocks and the varying sizes of cobble and river stone, depending on your quantities, that the, the price can go up a little bit more. Um, and so, but what we found even even generally speaking, is that a little bit more than half of people spend more than 500, a little bit less than half spend under 500. The average person spends around $550 on their rain garden. So it's um, generally speaking within or right around uh, the rebate budget. So design and construction. Uh, planting techniques, if you're familiar with perennial flower gardening or gardening of, of any kind, um, this will be familiar to you. So what you want to do with the rain garden is um, minimize how much you're walking 
onto it. So you'll, you will want to um, just make sure that you're not compacting that soil too much. Um, and then also what a, a good, whoops, I'm just getting rid of the questions here for a moment. Um, yeah, so what you can do is you can mulch first and then plant after. So that'll allow you to kind of walk over top of your rain garden with minimal compaction. So you can put your mulch down and then when you're ready to plant, you can just brush some of that mulch aside, dig your hole, put your plant in and then cover it back up. Okay, and then you want to water immediately after planting, especially if it's on a hot day, but by all means, um, you know, I would just water immediately after planting anyway. And then also we recommend being wary of landscape cloth. Um, it can be a really good thing to use if you want to create like a rock swale or a dry creek bed where you're going to have like cobble over top. It's a good weed barrier. Um, it also allows water to kind of permeate through um, and so it's fairly breathable, but it doesn't really have much of a place going like underneath plants. Um, it's just going to you know, inhibit root systems. Um, what people can do is score the landscape cloth, plant the plant um, in that hole. But we've found time and time again, um, we've really, you know, let people know it's not going to work forever. You know, there's debris that flies into your rain garden. Um, eventually weeds kind of creep through. So if you do want to use landscape cloth for any purpose in your rain garden, make sure it's good quality, like contractor grade. The cheap stuff just after a couple seasons, it won't cut it for sure. And we've seen that. So that's just a word uh, of caution. So for some planting techniques, this is a big rain garden. It's on Empress Avenue. It's in its second, in this picture, it's in its second year. Um, she did an amazing job. It looks lovely. Um, so she put her larger plants in the back. She's got some feather reed, that Carl Forster's grass um, in the back. And then she's got some nice kind of clumping grasses. Um, they might even be day lilies. I'm not too sure, but there's some kind of little clumping plants in the front. Um, you could also common plant your um, common plants in masses of three or more. Um, odd numbers tend to look pretty nice as well. And then you can put them in repeated masses on either side to provide a little bit of symmetry. And then if you want to, you can put the pot tags um, in your rain garden. But what I would recommend is, you know, you've got your planting plan that you're going to follow and then just keep it somewhere, you know, tucked away in your home for reference. So, you know, um, you know, what survived or what didn't um, and, um, yeah, it just gives you a good idea of what you've got going on in your rain garden. Now, a word about wood mulch. Um, there are, you know, generally speaking, two kinds. What you'll find more commonly is the wood chip mulch, and that's what's on the left here. It's the larger pieces, um, and it's there's a pro to it, like you'll be able to find it quite easily in bulk here. If you go to like a landscaping company, you can get the wood chips fairly easily. And um, that way you're not buying like plastic bags full of full of mulch. Um, on the other hand, the double shredded is much more fibrous. So um, it's got some real benefits to it when you're making a rain garden. Um, if you've got the real like wood chippy, larger, coarser mulch, um, when you have water coming in, that type of wood chip mulch is inclined to float. You know, it can wash away. Um, it can still work perfectly fine. There's many, many rain gardens that are planted with wood chips and it's great. It's been no problem. Um, but definitely there is that concern of, you know, the wood chips wanting to float away. And if your rain garden does get washed out, um, that's what you might expect. The double shredded, it's much more fibrous. Um, they tend to lock together. And so when the water comes in, essentially the rain garden just kind of expands a little bit and then, you know, the whole thing just kind of relaxes and the, the mulch tends to stay together a lot more easily. The downside of that is I haven't really found a source of like natural double shredded mulch here that you can't find outside of like a plastic bag. Um, so, you know, there's, there's that to weigh as well. As far as maintenance, it's pretty, you know, constant with your regular garden maintenance. Each spring, you maybe want to weed. If you need a fresh layer of mulch, you can add that. Um, plants will continue to grow in, and that's really what you want to do, is you want to encourage plants to start touching one another. And what that is going to do is it will reduce the competition for weeds. It's going to reduce the amount of sunlight that's exposed 
And over time, you know, say two, three, four seasons down the line, the whole idea is that your rain garden becomes just this lovely naturalized space that requires, in theory, very little maintenance, you know? Um, so definitely expect to be maintaining it for the first season, the second season, but you know, over time we do want, um, with those perennials filling in, we want that time to be decreasing. Um, you might want to remove some sediment or degree, debris. Um, and then we also recommend leaving stems standing through the winter. This can help with um, habitat for overwintering insects and pollinators as well. Um, so we don't really see much issue with keeping, you know, the deadfall um, and the dead stem standing over, over the winter and maybe cleaning things up if you have to in the spring. So here's some before and after pictures. We'll go through these and I think we'll have a question period after that and then we should be wrapped up. Um, so here's a picture of before. So we've seen this one earlier where they have the uh, yellow hose laid out outlining their rain garden before they started excavating. Um, he's leveling out the bottom part of the rain garden here. Okay, so that's kind of one of your first steps. They excavated and then you'll see here they built up those lower edges. So they did make a berm on this rain garden. So they took that excavated material and they were able to utilize it somewhere else in the rain garden. It's quite a big one too. He is stepping on the soil, but you know, your goal is to keep that soil nice and loose and fluffy as much as possible. Um, but you know, if you do have to walk over it, that's just, that, that should be all right. It's not uh, the end of the world. Here they did plant first. They didn't mulch first. They decided to put their plants in the ground before uh, they mulched, but you can see the wet areas here. They definitely watered right after planting their plants. So they've got their berms built up. They've got their um, plants put in, they've watered, and then they've pretty much finished off their rain garden with the rocks in the middle um, and then the mulch. So that's the finished product over there. This is on Summit Avenue. This was created a, a few years ago. It was on our, I think our first rain garden tour actually. So it's probably grown in quite a bit now. Yeah, filled in. Okay, um, so the next one, this one was designed by a professional landscape designer. Um, there's definitely some pros and cons to this one. I think it turned out, you'll see in this photo, to be a beautiful rain garden, but there might be some drawbacks that are worth your consideration when it comes to using um, rocks. So this is before, obviously, the, you know, the, the whole front yard she needed a, a makeover on. And so she hired a landscape architect um, to come in. And this is the after effect. So the more kind of the larger rocks in the middle um, is really kind of the settling area. And that's the kind of real rain garden itself. There's a bit of a swale. So I think she's got a downspout maybe with a rain barrel. Um, that's feeding that um, lower part of her yard. And then the rest of it is not really the rain garden. It's just she decided to make over her entire yard. Now, a word of caution with this is rocks can look really pretty. Um, they're quite beautiful, um, but they carry with them their own element of maintenance. And that's especially true when you've got other trees surrounding a really heavily rocky area like this. If you've got you know, trees dropping their needles or dropping their leaves in the fall time, um, that's all going to collect in between those rocks. And then, you know, you're going to have debris that over, you know, a season or two or three, you know, you might see seedlings, you know, popping up in between your rocks, um, grasses maybe coming through the landscape fabric, depending on how it was laid out or what it's made of. So it's just a whole other element of, of maintenance. I wouldn't say don't do it, but just be prepared with another layer of maintenance when it comes to rock gardens and to really make sure that you've got some really good heavy duty landscape cloth underneath if that's what you choose to use. Um, but then also to be aware of what else might be blowing in you know, to your rain garden over time, what other kinds of debris are coming in. But it does look really nice. This is the first year. I'd be curious to see, you know, what subsequent years look like. Uh, this one I thought was really cool to include because it's sort of a, a year to year photo. So this one was planted in 2015, uh, the top left, you'll see. So those plants were really tiny, you know, a couple of little blue stems, I think. Um, 
uh, not little blue stones, just another variety. I forget what it's called right now. But anyway, that was the first year. And then in the second year, so in 2016 is the bottom right, and you'll see how well those plants have established themselves. They've really been happy in that area. Um, and they were on the 2016 rain garden tour. Um, so that's what uh, that's what it looked like in the second year. So yeah, massive difference for sure. So if those perennials are very happy, they'll get established and then they'll just, you know, start taking care of themselves. Of course, there is maintenance if you want to trim them down um, and do some pruning, there is that, but um, they can they can really fill in the rain garden quite nicely. Uh, this is another one that is a front yard rain garden. You can clearly see that they marked um, their lines, their locates as well. Um, so they've got some different flags of where their rain garden is going to be. Um, so that's just a good kind of preliminary um, example of what you maybe want to consider doing um, for your rain garden. Okay, so they edged everything out, very clean cut. Um, they were going to have a superficial burial of their perforated pipe. So perforated is good because in the fall time, um, some of that water might be freezing and some of it might be thawing. And so in order to avoid like a water freezing kind of backup situation going up your downspout, having a perforated pipe um, can be um, really helpful in this situation. So that's sort of their, their next step there. You can see everything exposed. It's been raked and leveled off. And then they're going to take the material that they took out and they put it back in to shape their berm and to make a nice transition zone um, from the outside of the rain garden into the lower part. And then of course you've got your plants that they're putting in. And here you can see where they've got their rocky cobble inlet. So it's surrounding the pipe that's going into the rain garden. And then on the opposite corner, they have a lower kind of section where they've carved out a little, a little divot in their berm. They've laid down some cobble and that's going to be their outlet. So in the event that this rain garden overflows, they're basically channeling any kind of overflow water into that corner and it's gonna spill out and then just land on their grass and it'll, it'll be fine. Um, so that's a very controlled way of letting any excess water out. Okay, and that's just a different angle after the rain garden is planted. So again, they've got everything kind of buttoned up and buried. The grass is back over top. And that's the finished product there. And they've also planted what I think are probably some sprawling ground covers on the berm. So they've left that kind of exposed with the soil, but it looks like the idea being that, you know, those plants will eventually crawl over and spread and, and cover and stabilize the berm. Okay, so this is another example. It's a front yard rain garden. This was designed by a landscape um, architect in town and then professionally installed by another landscaping company. Um, so this was on one of our rain garden tours a couple years ago. They've got a couple really nice features in it. It's a very, um, you know, kind of driftwood sort of rustic feel. They've got some pieces of wood in, in between the lower parts um, of the, the rock area. Um, they've got sort of like a shelf of cascading plants that go into the rain garden. Really, really nice. Um, so essentially this is taking water from their rooftop. Uh, before this was installed, a lot of that water was going onto their driveway and flowing down their driveway into the neighbor's yard. Um, what didn't flow into their neighbor's yard was coming down their driveway and then in the fall time or the early spring, it would freeze and be a pretty significant tripping hazard. So they were pretty happy to install this rain garden um, just for their own, you know, benefits as well for their own land use too. So it made a lot of improvements there. And it also, you know, cut down on the amount of grass that they're cutting um, and just beautified their front yard. So they've got some black eyed Susans in there. I think they have some coneflower as well. This particular rain garden I like because um, they've even got some Solomon seal. So that's like an early spring kind of ephemeral plant. 
And so their rain garden is kind of blooming with different interesting things all throughout the season. And um, yeah, it's just a really neat one. So that's on Hill Street North. This was another um, kind of front yard full makeover. We saw some pictures of it earlier. So we've got everything just kind of torn up in the front yard. They definitely did um, some locates. So you can see the flags there um, for the utility lines. And that's the finished product. Again, this is a rain garden that it's in its second year in this photo. It's probably three or four years old now at this point. So that water is coming off the downspout and just running right into the rain garden. And that's a different angle there. They brought in some nice boulders and quite a lot of rock. I can't remember how much this one came in at cost wise, but I'm sure it was over $500. But also this one I wanted to include because we have many, many rain garden examples that are not, you know, really big and really massive, you know, rain gardens can suit, you know, many different styles and many different shapes and sizes, as long as they're accomplishing that principle of soaking up water, capturing it from a hard surface, slowing that flow down. Um, you know, this is a great example of a smaller rain garden that was built more of a shoe, on a shoestring budget and it can cost well under, you know, $500 and be well within your budget. And you can also use a lot of recycled materials as well. So this individual, she um, has a rain barrel, which would be an eligible expense in your, in your um, expense list. And then she created like a little channel, a little swale that goes under her walkway and then flows into the rain garden. This one's very simple. In fact, I think she even took some plants from other gardens in her yard and transplanted them into her rain garden. So you certainly don't have to buy things brand new. You can get some plants from your neighbor's yard. You can find some, you know, rocks, you know, not necessarily from, you know, the, um, the local nursery. You can maybe find things just in your yard or, you know, from a friend. Um, and bring them into your rain garden. And it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be, you know, really, um, you know, anything more than just something that's going to accomplish this function here. Um, so she did a nice simple kidney shape and it works really well with the rest of her, with the rest of her landscape. And um, she was quite pleased with it. This is another one here where it's a backyard rain garden. Um, I think we saw a picture of this one earlier on. So you can see they did their slope calculations. They have their stakes still in the ground. So it's their before pictures and that's after there. So they put a tree in this one right in onto the side. And then they had a nice little cobble um, inlet coming in, a little swale. Um, they didn't choose to put mulch in this one. They just wanted to stud the berm um, and have some little ornaments inside as well. And uh, that was just the first year that they put it in. Okay, so I guess that brings us to the very end uh, of our rain garden webinar. Um, so again, if you wanna stick around for the questions, you're more than welcome to. If you uh, have to go, that's fine as well. Um, you can, you can you know, do what you like. We're pretty much finished our whole session now, but I will take questions. I see that we do have some coming in and I'll try to answer those live right now. Okay, so the first one is I want to install my rain garden on the opposite side of lockstone paving bricks. Should I dig up the lockstone and put the drain hose underneath the stone? Many people have done this. In fact, we actually have um, some stone outside of our office. So we have taken up that stone and put a drainage feature, um, like a channel underneath it, um, so that, yeah, we're not having an overland flow over the lock stone. That could create a tripping hazard, for example. Um, so if there is a way to put it underneath that works with the slope of your landscape and that's not too much trouble to dig up the lock stone, um, then that's certainly something that many people have done, yeah. Okay, so is it okay to have the rain garden hugging the driveway and sidewalk, or does it have to be a certain distance from these? That's a great question. Um, definitely, we want to avoid the rain garden ponding or pooling area, not ponding, but the reservoir area, 
um, too close to any foundations. However, when it comes to the driveway or sidewalk, there might be concerns of heating. And it really depends on, you know, how much water is being captured there, how quickly it's going to be draining. Um, what we don't want is water kind of settling into the ground really slowly and kind of being held in that area and then freezing and then causing some heating issues. Um, we might want to fact check this, but the last I remember from someone recommending is minimum keeping about a four foot distance away from sidewalks and driveways. So that's what I would say for, um, for those areas. Again, for the foundation of any kind of building, I would say a minimum of three meters. But um, yeah, we're looking at about four feet for those areas there. Okay, so I did answer that one. Hopefully that's good. Um, all right, the next question is, do we need to consider what's happening in the neighbor's yard for catchment? This is one of the most common questions that we get asked is usually one person's, you know, runoff is another person's problem. That, that can be a really big issue. Um, so it depends on the slope of your yard. You know, if you've got water coming in from your neighbor's yard, then you're going to have to think about, you know, capturing theirs. Um, I'm not really too sure how else to answer that one right now. Maybe we can do like a one-on-one -on -one Ellen and, and look at your, your yard's specific situation. But um, yeah, I think depending on where you're placing your rain garden, especially if there's any kind of walkways or driveways, um, that's another thing to consider too, is how close it's placed to their property. Um, and then certainly, yeah, if you've got water coming from, you know, say their yard into yours, that can also implicate, you know, um, impact your decision. Okay, so this one says, are there any smaller or dwarf type trees that you would recommend for a rain garden? Um, some people, I think it's not native, I don't believe, but I think some folks have put in like a dwarf lilac. Um, certainly cedars, cedar bushes um, have been really, really popular. They love soaking up water as far as I'm, as far as I remember. Um, so often people will put like a cedar border nearby their rain garden. Um, and then that's a really, it's also if you want to add like a fence or any kind of privacy element between you and a neighboring property, that could be um, a good choice as well. Um, and if there's anything else that you want to think about, maybe, you know, the, the landscape companies or probably just the, the nurseries would have a good, a good couple of suggestions as well. Okay, so is the three meter requirement to the edge of the rain garden or where the water drains into the middle of the rain garden? I would say it's basically inclusive of, I mean, basically inclusive of the sort of edges of your rain garden. So, I mean, if you make your rain garden slopes really, really broad, I think there's actually a, a specific ratio uh, suggested in the manual. Um, if you make them really, really gradual, then this might be a little bit less relevant, but certainly like anywhere the water is going to be like held and that kind of lower basin reservoir part of your rain garden, you want to make sure that that catchment, that whole area is at least three meters away from your foundation. I hope that answers that question. Okay, so another one, do you have to prepare anything in your garden for the winter? Um, generally speaking, Probably not. Um, it depends on what species you use. Um, if we're looking at plants, you might need to wrap certain things. Again, if you're using native species, that's likely not much of a concern. Um, as far as the downspout is concerned, so if you happen to have like a PVC pipe or um, any kind of concern for water that is freezing in your rain garden or in that piping system, you want to make sure that there's no danger of it backing up and like freezing or expanding into your downspout. So what some folks might do is actually disconnect their rain garden and take it offline for the winter. Um, but what generally works pretty well is having that perforated pipe and then that usually alleviates that concern of anything kind of backing up into your into your downspout. Um, 
if there's anything more specific beyond that that you'd like to ask me, I'm happy to answer. But um, yeah, I think that would be the, the main consideration. Okay, now this next one is, can the rain garden be above the sewer line from the house to the street? Um, I think so. I, oh, like you're saying directly above. Um, yeah, I think with certain infrastructure, it should be okay. Um, we might have to answer this one or look a little bit more specifically at your property, Iris, but maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. Okay, thank you. Now this next one is, do you happen to have a list of a bunch of native plants that are eligible for the rebate? So Landon, if you look at the um, last part of the rain garden manual, we've got a whole list um, starting on page, geez, I don't really, where is it now? Page 33, so chapter seven of rain garden plant choices. These would be uh, most definitely eligible for the rebate. At least that would, would comprise the uh, minimum of 50% native species. Um, so any one of those. Um, and then we did do like a top 10 that we would recommend as kind of like bomb proof species for your rain garden that attract pollinators, um, different textures, different heights, different growing conditions or, or different um, rain garden planting zones rather. So yeah, definitely take a look through those. And then there's also a chart with additional rain garden plant choices on page 39 and beyond. Okay, now another one here is if we have questions regarding rain garden, garden locations and are seeking advice for locations, can we contact Eco Superior? Are there any other resources that you can make recommendations for placements? Um, yeah, certainly I think uh, if you were looking for locations, um, definitely contact me. Um, if there's a certain location in your yard that you're not quite sure about, um, give me an email, julia at ecosuperior.org. Um, as far as resources, you know, we, we did kind of find that there was a lack of resources in our area, and that's why we developed this design and installation guide for Northwestern Ontario. Um, so we couldn't really find a whole lot that was suitable for this region. Um, but Minnesota, I think there's a site that's called 10,000 Rain Gardens or 1,000 Rain Gardens, and they're really, really good. Um, but as far as the placement, I think if you're looking at, you know, an area that, you know, the, the water drains well enough, um, or infiltrates well enough, um, you know, it's far enough away from your foundation, um, you know, the slope is, is an ideal, you know, slope away from the foundation of your home. Those can all be really good criteria for the placement of a rain garden. Okay, and one more. Are there any downsides to making our rain garden larger than our calculations can tell us? Um, this is a good question. For sure, we've had some folks who um, want to make it larger. Um, the only consideration for this is, um, you know, for the rebate, we generally want to tailor it to the size requirement for the rain garden. Um, but also, if you make it too big, then that might mean that not enough water is getting into the areas that you might have planted plants, for instance, iris, um, that are really expecting and really wanting to uh, soak up a lot of water. If the rain garden is too big, it might not have enough water feeding those particular plants. Um, so it really depends. I mean, certainly making it larger isn't necessarily a bad thing, but there are just a couple of considerations just based on what kind of species you select and just making sure that, you know, they're going to get what they need um, uh, under the conditions that you, that you have them. All right, so that's pretty much it for the questions. I think I've got a few in the chats here. Um, all right, and I think most of these have been answered. Okay. One other question here, is it okay for the rain garden to hug my house? It has a spout that runs alongside the house. And I notice that some of the photos that some gardens are directly against the house. Yes, yeah, so this is a common um, misconception here. So certainly there are aspects of the rain garden mostly the swale, like that kind of rocky channel or the grassy channel, that's essentially conveying water 
away from your house. So the rain garden, like that would be part of your eligible expenses and that's part of the larger design. But what we wanna make sure is that the section of the rain garden um, where the water is settling and where it's being collected is definitely minimum of three meters away from the house. So you can have a nice kind of um, uh, swale or again that creek bed or that channel um, and that could start right at the end of your downspout and it could carry water but you know the idea is that water is not staying there and it's being carried into the lower section of the rain garden. Yeah, are there any other local resources available for a more comprehensive guide to native plants? Um, yes, that is a good question. We do have a native plant sale. Um, we did actually cancel it this year just due to just some of the adaptations we had to make due to COVID and um, some of the uncertainties around our programming. So we, we do have an annual native plant sale. Typically it's at the end of May, but unfortunately it's not happening this year. Um, the next best thing I would recommend is just call your local nurseries. So I do have um, another resource that I'll send out along with the local landscapers and it's just some updated information on what uh, some local nursery centers are doing in terms of curbside pickup. I have heard also that some of those stores are opening up. So, you know, I may not have the most current information and these things are changing you know, kind of by the day. Um, but yeah, definitely there are more nurseries in town that are getting a wider, broader selection of native plants and cultivars as generally a response to the growing demand for native plants and even as a response from this program over the years. So I would say Landell Gardens is great. Uh, Vanderwees um, has been getting more varieties, even um, Creekside Nursery, um, but yeah, definitely um, Lando Gardens has been very responsive to um, the demand for native plant species over the years, especially um, with regards to rain gardens. Okay, now there's only a couple more, I think, questions. One more here. Um, are nursery cedars considered native shrubs? Um, that's a good question. I don't know if they would be, but I think cedar in general would be considered like a native, a native plant around here. Um, so certainly it wouldn't be an issue. Um, the main thing that we're a bit concerned about is, you know, invasive species or some species that are just going to have like poor um, tolerance to our growing conditions here. So um, if it's not really falling into any one of those categories, then I, I wouldn't see them as um, anything of concern for a rain garden. All right, and hopefully I just answered that. And um, that looks like all of the questions for now. So again, thanks to all you folks who are still here. And if you've got any additional questions, please contact me. Um, our phone lines aren't really active right now because we're closed to the public, but you can reach me at julia at ecosuperior.org. And thanks so much, everybody, and have a really great night. Enjoy your evening.